This is the last watchdog podcast with Byron Akihito. Defending company networks has become a checklist affair. I spoke to Critical Starts Randy Watkins about why reverting to risk-oriented security makes a ton of sense. Critical Start was founded uh, back in 2012. Uh, We really wanted to bring value uh, from a security perspective to customers. So we wanted to use limited resources to improve their security posture. And that started off doing risk assessments, compliance assessments, penetration tests, which we still do. That led into product resell, and then eventually led us to form an MDR to really augment the capabilities that we saw missing from a lot of our customers when it came to tier one and two triage of alerts that were coming in. Okay, MDR, unpack that a little bit for us, because that's a little, you coined that a little bit toward what you guys are doing. Sure. It stands for Managed Detection and Response. It's kind of an extension of Managed Security Service Provider. So MSSP was the, the legacy term, and that really had a broad implication of providing service across a lot of different products, but not necessarily adding a lot to those services aside from the hosting. Well, MDR took that a step further and a step deeper and said, we're going to somewhat limit the integrations that we have, but they're going to be better integrations. We're going to add more value around it, and then we'll even move to respond to certain breaches or or compromises to lessen that dwell time of the attacker. You guys really are out there attempting to push the edge of the envelope in terms of what used to be called MSSPs, essentially managing services from a security standpoint to help relieve the burden on SMBs. Recently, you've talked about risk-oriented versus control-based approach to security. When you look at the foundation of security, it's really the art of handling risk. We used to go through these exercises where we would enumerate the risks that exist inside of an organization, uh, try to assign a value to the impact it would have if that risk was exploited, and then we would assign mitigation or acceptance or uh, mitigation, acceptance, or transference based on the largest potential impact to the organization and the probability it would happen. And that's the legacy model of looking at security and, and the model that actually should be used. Now, what it's turned into is, and not for the better in my opinion, is more of a controls-based security model where we're saying, if you have X, then you're secured. If you have all of these different controls, these technical controls in place, then you have this inherent level of security. But we never went back and quantified what you were secured against. Okay, so why, why is that fallen short in the current environment we're operating in with the SMBs have to go through along with everybody else. This whole idea of digital transformation, cloud-based, IoT coming, high velocity innovation. Yep. Why is there a disconnect there? There's definitely going to be technical controls that an organization has to put in place. There's no way to avoid product. I mean, it's people, product, and policy. But when we look at what you get if you're working off of nothing but a controls-oriented security model, it's not necessarily tailored to your organization. So look at all the different frameworks that exist from SANS and NIST and ISO, and there's plenty of good frameworks out there, and they all have this long prescriptive list of different controls that you should put in place. But should you? And if you look at how your business operates, does it make sense to put in some of those controls? If you put that control in place, uh, ultimately what it goes back to is, is the juice worth the squeeze? And if you spend all of the time, money, effort, energy putting in this uh, security control, is your return in, uh, in the risk that your organization faces, is that return there? Or did you just spend a lot of money to mitigate something that may never happen, or it'll be very low impact if it does happen? So working off of a strict checklist has been something that I, I feel has lessened the uh, the overall potential impact security teams could have on their organizations if they were really still trying to quantify the risk and then mitigate against that quantification and that, that kind of risk list. So what are you advocating uh, as a alternative approach to that? One that might be more effective in today's environment. Let's revert back to risk-based. So let's start off by identifying what would really hurt your organization. So if it's uh, IT-based, if it's computer-based, if it's asset-based, or if it's physical-based. I mean, there's physical security controls as well. Let's quantify what would really hurt your organization, what would set them back, what would stop them from generating revenue and producing their good or service. And then let's decide what the probability is of that happening. And if that were to happen, what theoretically would it cost? And, And CFOs are very, very good at assigning dollar amounts to potential risk. So let's get back to that risk acceptance list and then let's go through and decide are we mitigating are we accepting or are we transferring so you're talking about triage basically yeah i mean every organization should understand their footprint and what would adversely affect their ability to generate revenue well and that approach i it seem would also uh, orient you toward keeping an eye out for evolving risk fresh risk nailed in, it in the digital environment yeah there's
there's constantly this this need to do a reassessment. You should always be looking at different threat vectors that are coming out, different approaches. If there is a successful attack, was that on your risk mitigation list? Did somebody sign off on that as accepting that risk? Uh, or was it just absent at all? And if it was absent, why? Is it new? Is it something that we just missed? Uh, and then it's going into quantifying that. Do we spend the time and resources to mitigate? Or do we just accept or, or transfer based on probability and impact? So is this the general approach Critical Start is taking in, in providing services to SMBs? Yeah, this is the foundational approach that we started off with was let's not go in and push a bunch of boxes that may or may not help an organization. Let's go in and understand what keeps them awake at night and really recommend prescriptive controls based on their organization, what they can put in place, what they can operationalize and what will actually help. One piece of evidence that you're on the right track is that you're growing beauty here very rapidly at a, at a rate anybody would envy. And you just recently raised another most recent round of VC funding for $40 million. Nothing to sneeze at. Also partnering with some pretty heavyweight partners, Microsoft, Google Chronicle. What's the strategy behind that? What does that mean? And especially in terms of how that could will come to bear on your customers, helping your customers better. The the raise the round was actually our Series A. We've never taken funding. We were bootstrapped and we've been profitable since day one. Okay, sorry. so that's your first round. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So forty it, million. Yeah. It's and not it, bad. And it came uh, you know seven and a half years into the organization and in the development. We were profitable. We've always been profitable. But really, what we saw was this big need, and we've historically operated out of the Tola region, so Texas, Oklahoma, Louisiana, Arkansas. We do have some customers outside of that, but that's where we've been. And we wanted to take it nationally, we wanted to take it globally. We wanted to expand it. Uh, we see the, the need in our community, but across the U.S. So we wanted to address that. So what the, the newest round of funding, or the only round of funding does, what that allows us to do is put money into development to kind of increase the scalability of our product, uh, increase the capabilities there, increase the efficiency behind our service. It allows us to do better marketing. It allows us to hire salespeople and, and move into the channel to really approach the broader market that we've missed. And one of our bigger go-to markets that would directly affect a, a lot of customers is the historical managed service market. And this is everything from other managed security services that provide different venues of, of security service, but it also goes down to the managed service companies that just provide general IT support for SMBs or for you know small enterprise, small medium business. When we approach those guys, what we're giving them is the capability to resell enterprise level capabilities down to SMBs so they can they can have the exact same security posture as some of the, the larger Fortune 100 without incurring a lot of that cost or without having to deal with organization where they're just another name and number. They can work with the MSS that they've been working with or the MSP that they've been working with and still get those benefits. And so get security as you discussed at the top here that's more focused on the specific risks that and allowing them in a sense to uh, get the best bang for their buck on what they feel is the risks. Yep, we're going out to the channel, we're educating them on our approach, what we do, the services we provide, and in turn they can resell that to all of their customers. Tell us a bit about your partnering with Microsoft, Google Chronicle, a couple other people. Uh, we've had historical relationships with Silence and Carbon Black and OpenDNS and Splunk, uh, and now we're starting to explore other partnerships as well, namely Palo Alto Networks, uh, Microsoft, and uh, and Chronicle, Google's, or Alphabet's new venture. Uh, Chronicle just got spun back into GCP. Uh, so we're excited to be working with those guys. And, and what that is, is we're looking at who's leading the industry, who's really doing something new, different, uh, interesting, where can we add value, what are customers using, what are they asking for. And when we look at the larger AMOs, we're seeing a, a large demand around Microsoft products because E5 licenses are becoming popular. It's a one-stop shop to get literally everything what, you need. What's an E5 license? That's uh, Microsoft's. Uh, that's their all-encompassing SKU. So if you buy E5, you get Office. Windows, you get Office, you get Teams, you get everything from communication to security. So we're building in a partnership with them. Oh, you're, you're coming in on the security aspect of that? Correct. Yep. We're going to do, uh, we're going to be performing our managed detection and response services around their security portfolio. So really excited to be working with them. Chronicle is, I mean, they're, they're really disrupting the industry with their pricing model, their speed, their ability to deliver fast results, uh, which drastically lowers dwell time for attackers. So we've been working with them and their product team to go through the usual workflows of an incident responder, everything from detection all the way through remediation. Uh, and with their speed and, and the infrastructure they have on the back end and uh, the talent that they have to deliver on, on the roadmap, uh, we're really looking at some interesting capabilities that will help uh, a lot of businesses turn the corner at a reasonable price point. So we're really excited about that partnership. And then the last one we've been working with pretty extensively lately is 
is Palo Alto Networks. It's no secret that they've been leading the industry in uh, next-gen firewall, and they've recently made some acquisitions and released new products around their Cortex XDR, uh, which is their, it's EDR, but it's across all platforms. So it's a good way to combine network data with endpoint data, and now we're bringing that into our system where we can monitor everything all from one place and provide remediation capabilities based on the visibility from Cortex XDR. Wow, you got a lot on your plate. Yeah, we're uh, we're doing well. It's uh, it's fun. I didn't realize that you guys were mainly focused in the southwest region, Texas. Yeah, and we've we've been based in Dallas, so that's where our SOC is. We have a 24 by 7, 365 facility in, in Plano. That's growing. That's where all of our MDR services are, are rendered, and we're SOC 2 type 2 and all those necessary compliances. And we've operated out of primarily Texas and then slowly grew upwards, but uh, we see the need in the market. We see it kind of lingering out there with customers that are just unsure of how to get uh, bang for their buck, how to get past this uh, issue of false positives out of every security solution that's out there and really having no ability to detect and respond to attacks that are already being detected by their endpoints. It's just buried amongst a litany of other alerts. So really we're, we're approaching the market with a new way to um, uh, resolve the problem of reducing false positives at scale. And that's not a localized problem, that is a global problem. So we wanted to make sure that we could go to market across the U.S. and, and really help companies kind of coast to coast. Thanks for sharing, Randy, and uh, always a pleasure talking to you guys and look forward to the next conversation. Thank you. I appreciate it.